Pittsburgh Corpus. Leading off at playing center field. Cool. Papa. Bell. At third base. Judy Johnson. Playing first base. And not center field today. Oscar Charleston. Catching. The greatest home run hitter of all time. Charge. The greatest of all pitches, the leader of Satchel B. So now I remember a story about this. This <laughs> black boy went to into ballpark and he told the white manager, said, I'd like to try out for your team. So the white manager said, go away, boy. I don't have no room for a black boy on my team. So the kid came back the next night. And they asked the manager again, he said, I told you last night, go away. I don't have any room for a black boy on this team. So he came back the third night. And the white manager said, listen, I've had it up here with you. If you come back here tomorrow night, I'll have the police throw you in jail. So the following night, the kid bought a ticket right over this white man's dugout. And he sat there, and he bugged this manager, and he bugged him and bugged him. So finally, the manager told his coach, hey, get that man down here and give him a uniform. So I'm going to pick out a spot in this game to embarrass him so he won't ever come back because I know he can't play. He's just a lot of miles. So he brought him down and put him in a uniform. And this particular night, they were playing a team that had the ace relief pitcher in the whole league, a big giant of a white man that threw BBs. <laughs> so the opposing pitcher walked the bases full. And now the manager said, this is where I'll show this black boy up. He said, hey, you, you pinch hit him. So the kid ran by the bat stand and picked up the first bat he came to. And he walked up there, posed the manager, summoned this big relief ace pitcher from the bullpen. And the first pitch this big white man threw, this black boy hit it up against the right center field fence. And as he was rounding second base, the white manager jumped up and said, look at that Cuban go. <laughs> So you see, with one swing of the bat, he progressed from a black boy without a job to a Cuban with a job. That shows you how thin prejudice was. For over half a century, talented black ball players passed their lives in obscurity, victims of an unwritten gentleman's agreement that no black man was allowed in the major leagues. The rejected ball players formed their own teams and later a black league. The best rose to the top, and a few became genuine heroes. They became baseball's original nomads, wandering throughout North and South America in search of a ball game. When the National League was founded in 1876, blacks were playing Major League Baseball. By 1887, Moses Fleetwood Walker would become the last black American to play organized ball. It was the growing racial hostility following the failure of Reconstruction that pushed black Americans out of the game. My name is David Malasha. I was called Gentleman Dave in baseball. I was born in 1894. My mother was born in slavery. My father was a great workman on a big plantation. He was, he was the head man on the plantation. My mother had 11 children. I was the youngest of 11. And at my home at Union, Louisiana, as a little boy, I played on the small boys' team. And then my older brother played on the big boys' team. And my oldest brother played on the men's team. So you see, I played baseball all of my life. And when I went to New Orleans to school, I played on the city to school team and on the city team, the New Orleans Eagles. In 1916, uh, the Indianapolis ABCs was tra traveling from Cuba back to Indianapolis for the summer baseball. The ABC saw me play at, at college, you know, and they offered me a contract of $50 a month, and I thought that was a fortune. In 1918, I was drafted for the First World War. The 369th Infantry Division, in which David Malacha served, was among the most decorated units in World War I. Denied a combat role in the American Army, the 369th was thrown into battle under the French flag. 
Their triumphant return to the United States was highlighted by a glorious parade down Lenox Avenue. Harlem never saw such a sight. Shortly after the war, David Malacha joined Rube Foster's Chicago American Giants. Rube Foster was an unlettered genius who won the nickname Rube when he defeated the great major leaguer Rube Waddell in a barnstorming game. It was Foster who formed the first Negro National League in 1920. Modeling themselves directly on the big leagues, the Negro Leagues capitalized on the inherent drama of pennant races and urban rivalries to win the hearts of black baseball fans. By 1923, there were two Negro Leagues with franchises that stretched from Kansas City and Chicago to the Eastern Seaboard. I'm Judy Johnson, a Hall of Famer, Negro Hall of Famer. I've had quite a baseball career. Started back in the 20s. And I moved to Philadelphia where I spent most of my time playing professional ball there with a club called Hilldale. We had a very good ball club and was one of the best Negro ball clubs in the East at that time. And uh, we played, uh, we were the first Negroes to be in the Negro World Series. And I was fortunate enough to be the outstanding hitter of the first two series, 23 and 24. Saturday began the first day of May, and we would play for four and a half months, May, June, July, August, and half of September. We'd play sometime, play three games most every Sunday, doubleheader in the night game, and you get back to the hotel, you was tarred as a yard dog, but uh, the next morning we were ready to play again. The season ended the 15th of September, the regular league season. And then we would play the Negro World Series against the Negro American League. There were two Negro Leagues, Negro National League and a Negro American League. And we had six teams in each league. And the World Series were play, uh, was played in different towns. We, I remember one year we played the first game in Kansas City, the second game in Chicago, the third game in uh, Pittsburgh, and the fourth game in Washington. D.C., the fifth game in Philadelphia, and the sixth game in New York. Then also in 1945, I remember we were playing the World Series against the Cleveland Buckeyes. They were in the Negro American League. We played the first game in Cleveland, the next game in Pittsburgh, the next one in Washington, D.C., and the next one in Philadelphia, where they wasn't necessarily playing anymore because they beat us full straight. Negro baseball's greatest event was its all-star game called the East-West Classic. Played annually in Chicago's Comiskey Park, it attracted the interest of every black fan in the nation. This was Negro baseball's showcase and one of black America's most glamorous events. For the ball players, selection to the classic was often the pinnacle of a career of toiling on the American back roads. David Malacha recalls how it all began. One particular day, we were sitting in the restaurant in Pittsburgh for lunch, and the secretary of the Crawfords team was with us at the table. He said to me, he said, you know, Dave, he said, uh, we could found, organize a big game like the, ma like the Major League All-Star game. We could call it the East-West game. About three weeks later, when we came to Chicago, we found that the secretary of the Crawfords had gotten together with Gus Greenlee, who owned the Crawfords, and with my owner here, Mr. Cole, they had organized the East-West game. They picked the best of the teams, players from the East, and the best of the players from the West, to play the first All-Star game, East-West game, at the, and they rented Comiskey Park. The All-Star game was played in Chicago. Chicago was the mecca for blacks from Tennessee, Louisiana, Arkansas, you know, Missouri. All of these people, when you say, we're going to the big city, it was Chicago. 
You understand? So, and they played it in the summer. This is vacation time for a lot of people. So they would make it there. They would run excursions from Chicago, you know, they would, from Memphis, they, they would have maybe two or three cars on that train going to Chicago to the East-West ball game. This was it. It was one of the biggest affairs that's ever been held in Chicago. In the 1941 game, they had to turn away people. The papers list the crowd as about 51,000. We were playing the, our all-star game in Chicago, and uh, the score was nothing to nothing. And we had a man on third base. His name was Mule Suttles. And they hit the fly ball to right field. And Mule didn't think Crutchfield could throw. So he kind of didn't bear down and shoot. Crutchfield threw him out about 10 feet, and that's the only chance we had to make a run. I think it was the 41 game. There was a white kid there from Oregon, about seven or eight years old. He said his father had brought him all the way from Oregon, and he wanted to get a, and uh, wanted all the ball players to autograph the ball for him, and we did. For one thing, it was an honor to pick to play in, uh, to play in that thing. You know, it was an honor to be picked if you're just going to sit on a bench, it was an honor. But to be picked and it was inserted into the starting lineup, that was the glory part of our baseball. Mm -hmm. After the game was over, we get together. We stayed around Chicago and part it for a day or two. Oh, it, oh, it was fun. I mean, that was, uh, that was the only thing that would keep you interested in Negro baseball, you know. It was a pleasure you got out of it. While for many Negro leaguers, participation in the East-West Classic was their highest achievement, their most cherished memories were of postseason matchups with their white Major League counterparts. We played the athletic ball club back in the 20s, and they had their team intact. We beat them five out of six games. The people didn't, hadn't seen blacks and major league all-star teams mix too much in those days. So we always had large crowds. I think we played 10 games. Now, we knew that we could play baseball with anybody. If you've got Satchel on your team, you can play a team that they got nine devils on it. Uh, I remember in Yankee Stadium on a Friday in 1946, the year of the World Series was in Boston and St. Louis. We played the Yankee Stadium on a Friday night and a Sunday afternoon. I pitched against Satchel Page, and uh, we had two great ball games. They won one, we won one. We had over 100,000 people in Yankee Stadium for those two ball games at Major League prices. Nothing was cheap. We went for the regular Major League price. We played against uh, Dizzy Dean and his brother in Cleveland. And they had a sellout crowd, and Satchel beat Dizzy 2-1 in 12 innings. Bobo Newsom pitching for the St. Louis Browns. Huh? He was the best pitcher in the American League. And he's pitching that it went to leg, and we just, every time Bobo would pick up that ball, we'd tear him up. So he says, I'm going to tell you the truth. He said, I ain't going to. Go back to the maiden till I beat these niggas. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm just speaking. I just like it. he spoke. So we had a boy on the team, on the team named uh, Cool Papa. Our locker was here together, you know, Cool Papa, all of us sit together. My locker was here and Cool Papa's locker was there. So I said, Cool, I says, uh, you know what uh, Bobo Newsom said out there a few minutes ago? He said, he's not going back to the major league until he beat these niggas, <laughs> you know. So cool, Papa, that's when he got that name because he didn't, he didn't have nothing to say. He just played, you know what I mean? He wasn't talking to us at all. He said, what? what'd you say, Wells? He told, he's a soft talker, you know. I said, that's what he said. He said, well, I'll tell you what we do. We just keep him out here about two more years. I remember we were playing in uh, California in the Winter League, 
And I was with Satchel Page's All-Stars, and uh, we were playing the Major League All-Stars. They had Lou Novikov, Peanuts Laurie, Gary Pretty, Buck Newsom, and uh, Junior Stephen. They had a lot of Major Leaguers. And we played three Sundays, playing only on Sundays in, out in Hollywood. The first Sunday we played, we made $196 each. The second Sunday, we made $206 each. The next Sunday we played, we made $215 a piece. And then George Landis, who was the commissioner at that time, sent a telegram out there and told the major leaguers not to play us anymore because they had everything to lose and nothing to gain. We had everything to gain and nothing to lose. Although the Negro Leagues patterned themselves after the majors, they could not sustain a full 152-game schedule. Instead, they played perhaps 70 league games a year, and the rest of the time was spent on the road, playing any team, white or black, which promised a payday. We played all over the East. We played all over the West. We played all over the South. We would go to spring training in March. We'd go to Hot Springs and stay there for 10 days. And the, the 11th uh, day, we'd move to New Orleans. And we'd start playing every day from then all up until we'd play the, the, some of the big league all-stars. That was an everyday thing. And uh, of course, riding was kind of rough. You get in the bus, we had a nice bus, but no bus is comfortable riding every day. The life was hard. And the bus that we were riding in at, at first had only one door. That was the front door. Someone asked us one day, they said, what would y'all do if you have a fire inside the bus? So well, we was as we would get a can opener and try to come out of the bus. <laughs> we had a bus driver. He he was a marvelous mechanic, but he couldn't follow. He couldn't stay on the highway five minutes. We put a lookout man up there with him. And if the lookout man fell asleep, then we were off on the wrong road, and we had to travel too many miles as it was without going out of the way. We used to tell him that uh, if you have a wreck with the bus and uh, some of us get hurt, we were going to kill him. I would tell him that uh, don't pay any attention to the fellow while they just were having fun, see. But uh, sometimes he would take it at heart and think the fellows were riding him or something like that. But we weren't riding him. We were just doing something to kill the time. One night at 9.25, we dropped down off a hill in Nashville, turned in. There's a filling station right at the bottom of the hill. And we were going to St. Louis. and at, Quarter after five the next morning, somebody woke up and said, where are we? And the other player said, Nashville. Yeah, you got to be kidding. We were left Nashville last night. We played in Chicago one day, one Sunday, a doubleheader. And we, we packed the bus before we uh, went to the ballpark. After the game, we had dinner. And we rode from Chicago to Philadelphia without stopping. Uh, or resting and got there and played a doubleheader when we got there on a Tuesday. We would get tired in the riding. We would fuss like a bunch of chickens. But when you put the suit on, why, it was different. You just, you knew that was your job and you just go to it. I always remember and never forget here in the Catskills, we went 25 miles and bought a tire the manager, who was a very famous ball player, he was holding the tire on the run board. Now, perhaps you wouldn't know what a run board is, because cars today don't have run boards, but the cars had a run board on the outside where you could stand up on the outside of the car. Set the tire on there, and when we got back 25 miles, was up back to the car that we were going to help, the tire was gone. And it had, he had gone to sleep, and the t tire disappeared out of his hand, or out of, off the run board, and probably rolled down the mountains, who knows where. So we had to go back and do the same thing. This is one of the amusing parts of our life. Today, it's humorous. Then, it wasn't. There was no humor right then. And nothing could minimize the hardships of life on the road. There might be two, sometimes three of us using one bed, one double bed, because this was as much as they could accommodate. And we'd have two ball players staying in one house here, 
We might have a couple staying on an, another house next door or down the, the street or across town for that matter. They were scattered all over, but they were in private homes in, in so many of the cases. We stayed in hotels such as they were, but right then, to me, there was nothing wrong with them. I know I can think of a town, and I won't put the town on the spot. I can remember a town where we put up in a rooming house in Arkansas. When you turn on the lights, you see the bed bugs start to go for cover. So, we, and many a time that we put up into homes where, or pl hotels, where you'd have to sleep with the lights on, because if you don't, uh, those little gremlins would come out and you wouldn't get any sleep anyhow. One time I remember we were someplace in Alabama, and we stopped at a cafe. There was a lady standing right out in front. The guy started to get out of the bus. She started to shake her head. So we said, why are you shaking your head? We haven't asked you for anything yet. She said, whatever it is, uh, the answer is no. I said, well, can't we buy some water from you? She said, well, if you want to go in the back, she said, there's a well back there, and you can go back and uh, enjoy yourself some, some water. But she wouldn't sell us anything. So we, about three or four of us, went back and, um, uh, you know, put the pail down in the, in the well. And the dipper was a, was a gourd. It's like, a, you know, something, a melon that's a, put out in the sun and dried. And this is what we drank out of. So we, when we finished drinking our water and uh, started to get back in the bus, we looked back, and what she was doing, she was breaking the, the gourd, which we were uh, drinking out of. She was breaking it in little pieces. They thought that the Homestead Grays was a white team. So they had us booked into a very nice hotel. C. Posey was the secretary, traveling secretary. And he was very what colored people call, or Negroes, black, whatever, fair skin. So he went in and he got the rooms and everything. So they started to unload the bus. And when the players got off, they said, oh, no, no, you can't stay here. This is a white hotel. The average restaurant that we would come across in town, they just was not the, the it was an unwritten law, I guess. Nothing on the books, I suppose, but we just don't serve you in here. They were called niggers. They were called everything but they were a good ball team. And people came to see them play anyway, regardless, even if you sat, you know, had to be separated. But it wasn't only in the South, in the North too. Same way they called us names when we played on the field and all that sort of stuff. As the fame of the ball players grew, their reputations sometimes overcame segregation itself. We were going out to the ballpark, riding in, in cars. And we were speeding. The cops came up on a motorcycle, pulled us aside, wanted to know why in the heck are you guys going? We said, we're the Birmingham baseball players. He said, you are? He says, where's Satchel? He says, Satchel is just ahead of him. He said, come on, right to the ballpark. That's how he stood down there in Alabama. Ultimately, the ball players were happy making a living playing the game that they loved. And in the black communities of the North, they became authentic celebrities. The sand lots of black America were the proving grounds for the black leagues. There, in unsung obscurity, talented black ball players enjoyed a first taste of stardom. It was from such lowly beginnings that one of the Negro League's finest teams, the Pittsburgh Crawfords, emerged. There was a, uh, a street in Pittsburgh it was called Crawford, Crawford Avenue. And they had a baseball team, just a bunch of semi-pro boys. In the late 20s, Gus Greenlee became one of Pittsburgh's leading black figures because of his control of the North Side's numbers racket. 
supporting baseball was a means of legitimizing the black racketeers' stature in their community. In the absence of more respectable leaders, the numbers men had disproportionate influence. So he took over this team as a starter. He didn't, well, Crawford's wasn't in enough of a name, so he added Pittsburgh Crawford's and then began to bring in other baseball players, more professional players. He was going all out to be recognized. The big team around Pittsburgh at that time was the Homestead Grays. And Green Lee wanted to have the best team in the area. We had quite a strong club. With our outfield, we had Cool Papa Bell, Ted Page, and Jimmy Crutchfield. All very good ball players. And as you know, Cool Papa was one of the best outfielders that we've ever had in Negro baseball. Very few balls we had would go to the ground between them fail fielders. We, you could count them in a season. The balls that fell out between those fellas, they were wonderful ball players. If the ball was hit in the air and it was two outs, the pitchers didn't look back. They just walked off the, off the mound because they knew the ball was going to be caught. The people just took to the team, and we had Josh and Satchel. <laughs> Josh was hitting the ball all out of the state of Pennsylvania. Well, Satchel was a, a fellow you, you, you would very seldom lose in big games. I remember we were playing the Yankee Stadium one Sunday, and I guess we had about 45 or 50,000 people there. And they got Satchel in the hole where it was three men on and nobody out. So I, I was a team captain, so I asked for the ball, and uh, the catcher gave me the ball. And I walked over to Satchel, and I, I told him that uh, the players and all were hoping that they would get you in a situation like this because you were such a pop off, great showman. And he said, They did. I said, yeah, and I just tossed him the ball. He went back and they had a pitch and he threw nine balls. He struck the side at. And then he walked over to their, their dugout and said, now go back to Philadelphia and tell that. <laughs> he had a lightning fast ball, and it seemed that when the ball would get to the plate, it would go up just a little, just enough for you to miss it. I just could pitch and, and, and the master just give me an arm and, you just, it was, it was hard to beat me. You, you couldn't hardly beat me. He had good control. He didn't dust off anybody. And uh, we knew he was going to throw a fastball, but yet we could not get ready to hit it. The Pittsburgh Crawfords and Homestead Grays intercity rivalry was black baseball's equivalent to the Yankee Dodger competitions. In 1934, uh, Satchel Page was with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And he pitched a no-hit game against us and struck out 22. <laughs> that, that was on the 4th of July. See, I could go 17, 18 innings. You ask some of them guys, and they'll tell you. I wouldn't get tired, because I practice every day. I had the suit on every day. Put in there 365 days out of the year, I had that baseball suit on. Hall of Famer Buck Leonard of the Homestead Grays was asked which team was more popular. The Crawford, because they had such a piece. It made all the difference. We'd be on the field. Finally, somebody would say, hey, Satchel just showed up. And boy, it was just like sun coming out from behind a cloud. After Satchel Page, the two biggest names in black baseball were James Cool Papa Bell, the game's finest base runner, and Josh Gibson, the black Babe Ruth. I'll never shall forget this night. I was walking up the ramp with Jice, and one little kid ran up to me, Mr. Gibson, Mr. Gibson, will you give me one of your broken bats? Jice said, son, I don't break bats. I wear them out. <laughs> and, that, and that's how he appeared to do. He'd come up there with, and it seemed as though he was squeezing the sodas out of the bat. Of course, Cool, he was the fastest man that ever put on a pair of baseball shoes. 
he could go around the base in, uh, I think it was 12 and a half or 13 seconds, something like that. But he was really fast. And if he'd get a hard ground where the ball would bounce, he, he, he would chop down on the ball and make the ball hop up, and whoever got it, well, they just walk back to the position because he'd be down to first base. If he played on a, play, a parks like they play now with that AstroTurf, I don't think they ever would get him out. In Mexico, he, he was on, on the same team that I was on. And the first, first game he played in, he was on first base. The next hitter hit a ball into the right field. Cool Papa went to third base so fast, they stopped the game. He said he cut across behind the pitcher. He said, it's no, it's impossibly, no poeta said. It just couldn't happen. Nobody can go from first to third that fast. Now, somebody said that uh, he was so fast until he, he'd turn out the light in the room, he'd be in the bed before it got dark in the room. Now, I don't know about that now. That's the one on me, see. <laughs> well, he was in the class by himself running base. Of course, we had three outfielders that were they were fast, too. We had a boy named Ted Page and another boy, Jimmy Crutchfield, and Cool Papa Bell, but uh, they would get a ball while well, they were just unbelievable. Well, I, I had seen Cool. I knew his reputation, but I always believed that I could play as much outfield as anybody. Now, the Nashville Southern League had a park that was down in the in the Down hole. in the valley, in a hole. You had a bank like that one there with the oh, fence yeah. that run around the outside. Right field was way up high. Up the hill, yeah. And it was the, high up there. And, the, and the right field had to be a goat. You run up the, to play up the side that, of the hill. Play the side of the hill. So I remember one night we were playing a game. And I'm high on this hill so I can look down at the center fielder. They hit a ball over Cool Papa's head, and at the crack of a bat, boy, I can see Cool running. And he turned up the hill. at the right time, picked that ball. I said, well, Lucky that stopped time. me from saying that I could beat Cool playing outfield. So you couldn't get to the ball as quickly? I couldn't get to it, no. But you're a no great uh, outfielder, a great ball player. Who? You. That Thanks. <laughs> I'll scratch your back again. <laughs> The glory of the Crawfords was short-lived. While they dominated the Negro Leagues during the mid-30s, they fell dramatically, not to an upstart Negro League franchise, but to the manipulations of an obscure Latin American dictator, Rafael Trujillo. To bolster his political career, Trujillo sent his agents north in the summer of 1937 to bring back Satchel Paige and later his teammates. The entire Negro League was threatened. We went down to San Domingo, and one year, and I, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Uh, I like to broke up the Negro League because it's paying good money. <laughs> it's paying good money down there. I had uh, one of the world's greatest black baseball clubs down there, and uh, we had to win. We didn't know we was playing in politics. We had to see Satchel. Josh and Cool Popper went to Trujillo City, which at that time was the capital of San Domingo. I think they call it Dominican Republic now. So actually off the Pittsburgh Crawfords, there were six of us that uh, jumped. We, they called it jump in those days, jump the team and leave. See, just because you leave the team after those players leave, naturally the ball club just didn't need anything else. I had played before in Mexico with a great player by the name of Martin De Higa. And uh, he was the manager of this team in uh, the Dominican Republic. And he's the one that's had them send for me. The president of the team, he gave $100 for every pitcher winning game. And such he liked to pitch every game. He got all the best ball players he thought, and for him to win, his team to win, that give him give him more prestige. I said to the president of the team, I want to pitch because Sache, he want to pitch every week. We play, we have four pitches, so he's ready to pitch every game. 
One time we went over there to play them, and you know the ball players used to get together. We're all from the States. We'd go by where the ball players live and kind of socialize a little, talk about old times and things. And we went over there hunting for satchel in them and, and couldn't find them. So a little kid on the street, they know all the business. He said, it's down in the carcel. C-A-R-C-E-L, that's jail in Spanish. Trujillo had put them in jail that night before they are going to play us so they wouldn't rouse around. After the series was over, uh, Papa Bell told me this story. He says the general came up and said, you know, say, look, you play for the president. Say, we don't lose. So he's walking around and say, took his big 45 out, boom, boom, down in the, you know, court. Judge says, I, I said, I, I want to get the hell out of here. Say, how, how are we going to get away? Give us 25 minutes to get together and be on the dock. And we was together in 25 minutes and brought us to, get us to Puerto Rico. And then a clipper, they come got us and I never have been back no more outside of that. experience was a crucial event for all the better Negro League players. In Latin America, they earned good salaries and played in an integrated environment. They enjoyed fame and tested themselves against their white Major League counterparts. I played uh, 12 winners. Puerto Rico, Caracas and Venezuela, Mexico, and Cuba. I was in uh, Puerto Rico in 1935 in the winter of 1935. I would play ball here in the summer and then go down there and play during the winter. Our whole Pittsburgh Crawford team was invited to play exhibition games in Mexico against some mostly Cuban and Mexican ball players. And um, the American League sent an all-star team down there composed of Jimmy Fox, Rogers Hornsby, and a few others. In 1935, we were down in uh, Puerto Rico playing during the winter. We had an all-star team there. In Cincinnati, Reds came down there to spring training in the spring of 1936. And they said that uh, we were going to play them a few games after they got in condition. Well, they practiced about two or three weeks and got in condition, or well, some condition. And we played. And we won two out of three, and they said that uh, they didn't think they wanted to play anymore. 1945, I was with Jackie Robson, Campanella, Sam Jethro, all of us had an all-star team to Caracas in Venezuela and played against the local teams. And we were too strong for them, and um, they told us that we had to lose a few ball games. After we won the first nine, they said that we had to lose one or two. So we told them, no, we weren't going to lose in the ball game, that uh, if we were just too strong for them, well, we would just come on back to the United States. So they took the second baseman and a pitcher and a catcher from us and put on a local team. And we still beat them. And then they said, uh, look, say we got, you got to pitch a, some other pitcher. Don't pitch one of your regular pitchers. And we pitched a third baseman, a fellow named Felton Snow, and we shut him out for nothing. <laughs> so they said, then I said, we know we're going to send you home now. But we did, uh, they sent the Cuban, got a team to come there to play us. And they also sent to Mexico, got a team to come there to play us. And we had a pretty fair contest after that. So uh, then in, uh, in Cuba, in 1939, this is the first time I ever been put out of a ball game. And uh, I was playing first base, and a fella came down to first base, and the umpire called him out, called him safe, and I thought he was out. And I was talking to the umpire in English, and the umpire didn't understand English. He understood Spanish. And he put me out of the ball game and said I called him a word. So I was telling him about, no, I didn't call him a word. So we called the manager over and told him to tell him what I said. He said, I'm afraid to tell him what you said. <laughs> the best Caribbean baseball was played in Cuba. The Negro Leaguers and Cubans had a long and lively rivalry 
in both the States and in the Caribbean. Ted Page recalls one of Cuba's most outstanding pitchers. Louis Tian Sr., the old man who was a good left-hander during those years, pitching for the Cubans. He had all the pitches, really, and could throw hard. I had tripled off of him the first time up. I tripled off a curveball. You know, throwing curveball to left-hand hitters is supposed to be, you're supposed to get them out and back them away from the plate. But I, I guess I pulled right into that one. Next time I came up, he threw me what I thought was going to be a curveball, and I just sort of leaned in on it to wait for it to break, and it broke right up the side of my head. And I still have a clean spot up there now. That no hair has grown back there in 50 years. And I laid right out at the home plate, and they put water on me and trying to get me back to, not to normal, back to life. And I can remember sort of coming back to my senses, and I could hear Tiant say to me, you know he had that one too well. And with me lying flat on my back and my head getting bigger and hurting, I thought the best he could do uh, would say, are you all right? The Cubans and the American ball players, we were enemies, bitter enemies, really, on the ball field. At night, afterwards, we were all through. We were best of friends. We played cards together, we'd do whatever we baseball players do. No problem. But as soon as we got on that ball field, we were bitter enemies. In the mid-40s, a new threat to American baseball appeared from south of the border. Mexico offered them such fabulous salaries. I made so much money, uh, I had a trunk full of them pencils. Look, 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 look. And when it got to the border, I could put them in the watch pocket here in American currency. You see, there were two multimillionaires, the Pasquale brothers, I believe their name was. So they got after our Negro players. I didn't feel, first of all, I didn't think I could match the Pasquales. I heard they were multi-millionaires, and if we'd ever got in a, a bidding contest, they would have definitely won. <laughs> and secondly, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do. Latin American baseball was an exotic part of the Negro League's story. However, the relationship between the underworld, the gangster world of the black community, and the Negro Leagues was black baseball's most fascinating and unknown chapter. Abe and Effa Manley owned the Newark Eagles, and Abe controlled Jersey City racketeering. Oh, he was in a 100% illegal business, but the people loved him. He was what is known as a number banker. He had enough money to throw away on investing in something that he wanted to do, which was a organizes Negro baseball, and he ended up actually losing or investing, or I guess the word's all right, $100,000 in the Negro baseball. But he enjoyed it, and we always had a wonderful team. A lot of our black owners were in number business at that time, and that's how baseball wasn't paying off. But with the side attractions, like numbers and piccolos and all like that, and maybe something else, gambling maybe, that's how they helped and was able to take care of baseball. The gate receipts and the other things, of course, you know, there wasn't no endorsement, there was no television, there was no radio or anything like that at that time for black baseball. So they had to have some other side attractions to keep the team going. And it, because the team didn't make enough to pay out a salary and so forth, buy buses and so forth, so they had to have a little something else going. In the 1930s, many racketeers owned Negro League teams. Pittsburgh's Gus Greenlee was perhaps the most flamboyant of them all. I'm always happy to repeat that Gus gave me a job one winter doing just what I'm doing now. I sat in a chair from 11 until about 3 in front of one of his places to, I was a lookout, and I got a salary for just sitting on that chair for about four hours. All I had to do is to, if I saw some suspicious-looking people, 
drive up in the car or coming down the street who looked like they might be uh, police, I just pressed the button. And I didn't have to press that button once all winter long. I get $15 a week just to sit in that chair for those four hours every day. I thought then that Gus would, well, I knew he was doing me a favor, but I thought, why would Gus do this? And after I had thought about it, Gus did this little chore for me to keep me, make sure that I was there for the following spring to play with the Pittsburgh Crawford. Because I had developed a, I guess I had allowed a tag to be hung on to me as a guy who would jump from one ball club to another. I was there too for the next spring, which was in 1933. During the war, many of the big league players entered the military service and the rosters of the major leagues were filled with 4F players. The contradiction between fighting a war for democracy and living with baseball segregation was highlighted by the wartime slogan, if he's good enough for the Navy, he's good enough for the majors. Integration was imminent, but segregation still persisted. Negro League veterans like Chet Brewer knew they could make it in the majors. But I tell you how hard it was. They had the propaganda that no Negro could play in the major leagues, in organized ball. They even went so far, and I, I'm saying this with no malice, no prejudice, anything, to hire one armed white man to play before they'd give a, a colored man a chance with two arms. And everybody out there knows that the only thing that a one armed man could do as well as a man with two arms is to scratch on that side if it was itching. <laughs> I never dreamed of getting to play in the major leagues because uh, then it was really a barrier that kept us apart, although they knew that uh, we were good enough. There's some of us who would uh, like to have had a trial and believe that we could have made the major leagues, some of us. My first scouting job was with uh, Mr. Connie Max Athletics, and we were very good friends, and I, uh, Ask him one day, I was up the ballpark, why they wouldn't hire some Negroes since we were we would beat them all the time. He said, well, it's just too many of you boys to go in at once. But uh, that's far as it got. I, I realized, though, <clears throat> that I, I could play big league ball. I knew it. I remember one Sunday evening, we played a doubleheader in Griffin Stadium in Washington. And Clark Griffin asked George, Josh Gibson and I to come up to his office after the game. We went up and said, uh, you boy like to be in the major league? Yeah. You like to play on the senator? Yeah. Do you think you can make the team? Well, we'd be out there trying. Then he explained it. He said, well, at this time, don't anybody want to be the first to take blacks into the uh, American, into the major leagues. He said, but we know you boys can play ball, and we know you can play good baseball. And some of us would like to have you. He said, but the time just hadn't come. And uh, the time had not come. On October 28, 1945, the barrier fell. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson, a rookie shortstop with the Kansas City Monarchs, was selected by Dodger general manager Branch Rickey to reintegrate baseball. I think Jackie was an excellent choice because of his intelligence and, then, and put that together with his ability made him a natural because there are a lot of other great ball players in our league, in our Negro League, but they wouldn't have taken what Jackie did. He was smart enough to know that it, it, it would all work out. Some of the others, hotheads, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have stood still for it. I don't know if I could have done it or not. Now, all of us believe, and all of us, most all of us, who I talk to, think that Jackie was the ideal man to be the first to get into the major league. Now, he wasn't our best baseball player, but we believe he was better, was the best man at that time because he had played with whites in uh, college. He was big, weighed about 100, 205 or six or something like that. He was about six feet, and uh, he was fast, and uh, he was intelligent. And that went a long way with being the first to be in anything. He was signed by the Dodgers and sent to Montreal in 1946 to 
begin his uh, uh, organized baseball career, he constantly improved and he became a real star, say, in, in a couple of years for the Dodgers. For many Negro League owners, Branch Rickey was not a hero. Mr. Rickey's um, program was very unfair. After all, he took Jackie Robinson and Don Newcomb and Roy Campanella from our Negro baseball without even saying thank you, let alone answering our letters or giving us any compensation for them. And for many Negro League players, integration was bittersweet. When they took him in in 1947, I was 40 years old. And I knew I could play major league ball at that age. Couldn't even hardly play black baseball at that age. And uh, one thing, when you're playing baseball and you get old, the nights are not long enough for you to rest. You're just as tired the next day as you were when you went to bed the night before. Several of our boys made it to the majors. I know you've all heard of Larry Doby going to Cleveland and Monty Irvin going to the Giants and Don Newcomb going to the Dodgers. And there were many, oh, there were so many. We had a third baseman, Ray Dandridge. What a third baseman. He ended up in the minors after the, the Negro baseball collapsed. And there were about a dozen more of my players that went to the minor league teams took. Of course, they were all getting a little older, but they could still play. As a few Negro leaguers slowly trickled into the majors, the Negro League owners finally decided to assert themselves. When I called attorney Kessler in and asked him to gamble with me, he agreed he would. And he wrote Mr. Rickey, Mrs. Manley was claiming Monty Irving's contract and so forth. And what did Branch Rickey do? He just wrote Monty that he didn't want him. So you can imagine what the Negro newspapers did to me. Attorney Kessler's first move was to go to the New York Yankees to see if they would take Monty. And they still weren't ready to take the Negro players. They turned him down. So his next move was to go to the Giants. And the Giants apparently felt that it was time to get in on the bandwagon and they agreed to give me $5,000 for Monty Irvin, which I very gladly took to get the Negro papers off of me. <laughs> the golden years of Negro baseball were over. The fans deserted us. The bottom just dropped out of Negro baseball completely because they wanted to see the Negro ball players on the white teams, and they just deserted us so that... that um, I begged my husband that first year to quit, and he wouldn't. He was a born gambler, and it was just a little bit more of a gamble for him. But the second year, he not only realized the handwriting on the wall, and he was ready to quit. While the younger generation of Negro League players won fame in the major leagues, the old-timers receded into obscurity with only their memories. It's a good life for us. We're happy when we play because we have a chance to make money in all year. It's different when you work in the other thing. When you work in the factory and some play, nobody knows you. But when you play ball, everybody knows. Everybody remembers. My wife taught school for 50 years, and I played ball winter and summer. I'd go to Cuba and Mexico, Florida, and play winter ball, and. Uh, she would always stay home and work. And uh, that was the way we uh, made our life. And without her, I'm quite sure I would never have been a ball player. But she kept me with both feet on the ground. She's a great, great woman, great woman. There remained one final chapter to the Negro League story. Simple justice required that the Negro Leaguers be recognized for their talents. Simple justice required that the very best be included in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I was inducted the same year along with Jackie Robinson in 1962. It was, uh, it was time, it was over, time was overdue, and they belong there. And uh, uh, I think that uh, 
It's a shame that he didn't hadn't been able to play in years gone by, but that's the way our society was at that time. I'm glad any of those uh, inequities have been corrected, and there's no excuse anymore for anyone in this country not to make it as far as they can. The commissioner said, we met here this morning to make an important announcement. He said the, commi the committee has seen fit to select Josh Gibson from the old Negro Leagues to the Baseball Hall of Fame. He said the committee has also seen fit, and when he said that, I started sweating. A sweat was meeting right under there, dropping down on my new suit. <laughs> Say the committee has also seen fit to select Buck Leonard for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now that was the greatest moment of my life right there. 1971, Satchel Paige. <laughs> I would tell you if I knew how old he was, but I don't. In 1972, Buck Leonard. In 1974, Cool Papa Bell. In 1975, Judy Johnson. The memory of those fellas I never will forget. They were quite a team. We used to have a lot of fun. And then there were some sad days, too. But uh, there was always sun shining someplace. So that's what we look forward to, the, the big days, the best days. A fella in Denver had, a, had an automobile, a brand new automobile. It was a page, a grand page, a beautiful thing. So, he put nine of us in his car and took us down to Wichita. Went to Wichita, we played in the tournament in Wichita. But uh, who, who, who won the tournament was uh, Bismarck. Bismarck had second page. Huh? Double Duty Radcliffe, Hilton Smith, Quincy Troop. They had some great ball players on that ball club, see? And uh, we didn't have a chance to beat them. Chet Brewer pitched on that ball club. So they won the tournament. But got to get home, nowhere to go, so I called Mama. Told her, say, tell Papa I, I want to come home. Said, okay. There was two of us, the other youngster from Sarasota, and they sent us two tickets, train tickets, no money, two tickets. I had 75 cents. We took that money and, and, and took that 75 cents, got on the train, on the way to Sarasota, and the first time we had any food after we left Wichita was in uh, Chattanooga. But anyway, we got home. When I got home, uh, I tell you, I ate so much, my mother cried. I slept two days. I said, Mama, I'll never leave again. Never. This is 35, 36. <laughs> when they start throwing that ball, I'm ready to go again. <laughs> 